Hello, I am uh, Dr. Chuck Wagner, Professor of Education Administration at Eastern New Mexico University. My job is to help teachers become administrators. I wish I could be there with you today, but I'm sure I would only be uh, spreading coronavirus around. Give you a little bit of idea of where uh, Eastern New Mexico University is located. We're located right there at the tip of the red arrow. We're uh, between Clovis and Hobbs, but about 90 miles north of Roswell, which everyone knows about. New Mexico is a beautiful, uh, beautiful state. I'm originally from Illinois and spent 55 years there, 35 as school administrator. Retired from Illinois and uh, found a job at Eastern New Mexico University, and I've been there now for 17 years. The first case we want to talk about concerning reasonable suspicion and how school administrators are able to utilize that is uh, the New Jersey versus TLO case in 1985. TLO was a 14-year-old female student at a New Jersey high school. And a teacher found TLO and another student uh, encased in cigarette smoke in the girls' restroom. And one of the girls was actually smoking. TLO wasn't. The teacher brought the two students to a school administrator who questioned each of them. The second student admitted to smoking cigarettes in the restroom and TLO emphatically denied the allegations, even though she was around, surrounded by cigarette smoke. The administrator then accused TLO of lying to him and demanded to see her purse in an attempt to find cigarettes. Among other things, when the administrator opened her purse, he did find a pack of cigarettes, and he found cigarette rolling paper. And due to the fact that the administrator was aware that cigarette rolling paper is used to smoke marijuana, he now suspected TLO of marijuana use. He further searched TLO's purse and found a small plastic bag containing a grass-like substance and items that could be drug paraphernalia, including a pipe, a wad of money, a piece of paper with names of students on it who owed TLO money, and uh, a letter that uh, appeared to implicate TLO in dealing marijuana. The administrator immediately contacted the police, who in turn contacted TLO's mother, and her mother brought TLO to the police station along with the police, where she confessed to selling marijuana and, yes, confessed to smoking in the restroom. Now, due to her age, TLO faced delinquency charges in juvenile court, and the juvenile court denied TLO's motion to suppress her confession and the evidence found in the purse from the search. Her lawyer argued that the search of her purse was a violation of the Fourth Amendment. TLO was found delinquent and was put on probation for one year, and after a lengthy appeal process in New Jersey state court system, the United States Supreme Court of the United States agreed to hear the case. And the United States Supreme Court agreed that a school administrator could search a student if they had something called reasonable suspicion. And the support court ruled that because she was in a fog of smoke in the uh, restroom, that that indeed was reasonable suspicion. Now, what is reasonable suspicion? Well, unfortunately, I can't give you a good definition because there is no exact definition. But a reasonable suspicion should be based on facts specific to your situation. It cannot be or should not be based on a rumor, a hunch, or just a curiosity. For example, a teacher cannot ask to search a bag that looks weird and bulgy for uh, contraband based on only the look of the bag. A 
1995, the Supreme Court took the second case dealing with search and seizure in the case of Veronia School District versus Acton. This was uh, a school administrator uh, led, uh, had a discovery that the high school athletes in the Veronia School District participated in illegal drug use. And school officials were concerned that drug use increases the risk of sports-related injuries. And consequently, the Veronia School District of Oregon adopted a student athletic drug policy which authorizes random urinalysis drug testing of its student athletes. Now, James Acton, a student, was denied participation in the school's football program when he and his parents refused to consent to drug testing. The Supreme Court, and this was a basically conservative Supreme Court, ruled that a suspicionless drug test of student athletes is more than reasonable because student athletes are not used to uh, privacy anyway because they all go into a communal locker room. And uh, if a student is on drugs during a participation in the particular sport, there's a good possibility that the student could be injured or otherwise uh, hurt. And the Supreme Court said that's a reasonable expectation for athletes to be drug free. So at any point in time, if the school district has a policy that allows for a urinalysis test of student athletes, then that is constitutional. This would be a reasonable less search. You're not, no specific athlete is targeted. You just randomly choose athletes. And if you get one that tests positive, then you move on to step number two. What is really surprising to me was the uh, Hattawatomi versus Earls case in 2002, where the Supreme Court extended a urinalysis search for not only athletes, but for any member of a school club or organization, which could mean cheerleaders, band, debate club, anything you want to think about. Once again, you draw random numbers and uh, or pull names out of a hat and you test a random group of these students. Now, the caveat is, which many districts ignore uh, for Veronia and Potawatomi, is that the school is supposed to, the school district is required to establish the fact that there is indeed a drug problem among athletes or members of clubs in the school prior to formulating this kind of a policy. But uh, as I said, many school districts just ignore that and conduct random urinalysis tests. In 19, 2009, the Safford United School District versus Reading, this was a, bit, a little bit different of a situation here. This was uh, Savannah Reading was an eighth grader at the middle school and was strip searched by school officials on the basis of a tip from another student that uh, Savannah might have ibuprofen on her person in violation of school policy. And so they strip searched her all the way down to her bra and underwear, which they made her pull out, looking for ibuprofen. Now, Miss Redding and her parents subsequently filed suit against the school district and the school officials responsible for the search uh, of the district. And this was a school in Arizona. And she alleged her Fourth Amendment right to be free of unreasonable search and seizure was violated. The district court granted the defendant's motion for summary judgment and dismissal of the case. On initial appeal, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit affirmed. However, 
On rehearing before the entire court, the Court of Appeals held that Ms. Redding's Fourth Amendment right to free unreasonable search and seizure was violated. And it reasoned that the strip search was not justified, nor was the scope of the intrusion reasonably related to the circumstances. However, Supreme Court took the case and ruled that strip searches are sometimes not unconstitutional. It certainly depends on what you're looking for. Ibuprofen would not be something. A stolen $20 bill would not be something. You would have to be going for a weapon of mass destruction or a gun or a bomb or something to pass muster of the court. So you see strip searches continue around the country, and that was from about two years ago, because the court was not clear. Now the question is, can the school search my locker? And the question, the answer to that question is, it depends if the locker is considered school property. And any school district that has any sense about them at all will have a policy that says the lockers belong to the school and may be uh, opened at random for any uh, thing that the school believes is not uh, kosher to keep in your locker. Purses can be searched, backpacks can be searched, pockets can be turned out, uh, shoes and socks can be required to be removed by the student. There was a, a district court case that ruled that just removing socks and removing shoes was not a strip search, did not constitute a strip search. And uh, that was appealed to an appellate court, and uh, the decision was upheld. So, what's a school administrator to do? Well, reasonable suspicion is not probable cause. Probable cause necessitates a search warrant signed by a judge and police uh, law enforcement uh, interaction with the search. Now, many schools have resource officers, and the question is still to be decided on whether a resource officer needs a warrant uh, to search a student in school. That question's up for grabs. This is my email if you want to contact me further. It's Dr. Wagner, this is my grandson, Josh, who helped the preparation of this, uh, this PowerPoint. Uh, thank you very much.